So welcome to the Insight Meditation Center. And my name is Gil Fransdahl, and I'm the teacher here, the primary teacher. This is going to be a six-week course in mindfulness uh, practice. And primarily uh, during the course, we'll focus on mindfulness meditation. Uh, but uh, everything, most of the things I'm going to be talking about apply in daily life as well. And this is a very important thing to understand, that the line between meditation and daily life is an arbitrary line. And sooner or later, people who meditate realize how arbitrary that line is and become interested in how to uh, live uh, in daily life with the kind of integrity, the kind of intimacy, the kind of uh, freedom that can be in meditation. Um, so why, why should it only be in meditation you feel free? Why should it only be in meditation you feel peaceful or happy or, or have, I feel like you have a kind of high degree of integrity? And then the challenge is to how to take the wonderful benefits, uh, conditions that come with meditation and begin living that in your life. Not that you have to look like a zombie. You know, some people associate meditators with being really calm. And the unfortunate thing is that people think that I'm kind of calm. So I'm not a good spokesperson for, you know, a passionate meditator. (laughs) So don't use me as, you know, the last uh, word on what it looks like to be a, you know, lifetime meditator. I'm just, you know, who I am. And um, the point is not to be, in, in Buddhism certainly, but also in this practice here, the point is not to become somebody, but rather the point is to become free. And become free means you actually become freer to be who you are. Um, uh, uh, you become free of what's extra. And what we're most concerned about in Buddhism is the extra is the, that stuff that causes you to suffer or causes uh, your behavior uh, to uh, bring suffering to others. So that kind of gets, as you meditate, just mindfulness meditation, the cause and condition for suffering tend to shed and fall off. And what's left is uh, not nothing. What's left is happiness, peace, calm. What's left is uh, greater insight and understanding and wisdom about this life that we're living. So um, mindfulness can exist quite well without Buddhism. Buddhism cannot live without mindfulness. And mindfulness certainly is very key to the whole Buddhist enterprise. And it's kind of an interesting uh, fact that that's the case. Because um, um, the, um, what's required in Buddhism is not a doctrine, not a belief, but rather is an enhanced capacity to pay attention. So my mother, when I was small, she would tell me regularly, Gil, pay attention. Pay attention. And mostly I didn't listen to her, which is what kids are supposed to do, right? And, uh, and so it's my karma now as an adult. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's kind of, you know, tradition. And that's the whole thing we do is to pay attention. So what we'll do here over the next six weeks is um, I'll teach you uh, some of the basic elements of mindfulness meditation, of of using your attention in an enhanced way, in a way that hopefully is useful in your life. And um, the way it's done is uh, systematically. It doesn't have to be done this this way, but we do it systematically. Uh, So today, I'll lay out the basics of the practice, including uh, the very center of it for meditation, which is the breath, breath meditation. Mindfulness, attention to your breathing. And then next week, we'll talk about mindfulness of the body. It turns out that Buddhist spirituality uh, puts a tremendous importance on being embodied, being connected to your body. You wouldn't believe that if you read a lot of the books about Buddhism, which is kind of intellectual and stuff. But if you go and hang out in practice centers, you find out that the body is really important, getting into your body, being in your body. Then the third week, I'll talk about um, emotions. Emotions are a big part of our life. We're not expected to leave our emotions behind. Uh, but rather to learn how, in a wise way, to include them in the field of attention. Then the fourth week, uh, it, the subject will be uh, thinking. And uh, thinking is a big issue for meditators. And some people think that you're not supposed to think when you meditate. But uh, rather than having that idea, what our idea is that you want to learn in a wise way how to pay attention to thinking so thinking doesn't get in the way, doesn't cause suffering, doesn't become an obstacle to um, uh, becoming more peaceful and, and uh, insightful. Then the uh, fifth week, uh, we're going to talk about the mind. And uh, set mind being something separate from um, thinking. 
and uh, it's a very important week. And then the last week will be uh, a lot about uh, practicing in daily life, about uh, taking this whole meditation practice to a whole different level uh, beyond what the instruction has been to that, up to that point. So those are the six weeks. And um, most of those weeks, uh, there's a handout uh, that uh, we'll put out at the table out there. And uh, this week, it's out there on the table. Now, it's this, this color here. Every week, it's a different color. And uh, it reviews some of the things I say in the class. And um, it also gives you some uh, exercises you can do uh, at, um, at home during the week that kind of can, can, uh, can enhance this experience here. This is also found on our website, this handout. So you can download it from there somewhere. So we all can pay attention to some degree. And if you pay a little bit of attention to how you pay attention, what you'll probably discover is that you'll pay attention for a short period of time. And at some point, you'll either get distracted from what you're paying attention to and you'll go off into future thinking, past thinking, into fantasy. Or, if you stay connected to what you're paying attention to, you'll somehow start thinking about it. And you'll think about it in such a way that the thinking pulls you away from the experience. So, for example, you might, if I'm talking, if I say something brilliant or something horrible, you might start thinking about what I've said and not notice that I'm just continuing to, uh, to, to, uh, to talk because you're kind of retrospective or thinking about what just happened, what we just said. So you got hung up, in a sense, with the experience. So you paid attention, something happened, and somehow you got hooked, got caught, got involved in that experience. So you couldn't pay careful attention to the next thing that happened in the moment. What we're trying to do, so that's a very interesting phenomenon, because that place where we get hung up, or we get distracted, get pulled away, is a very important key to understanding what motivates us, what our values are, what um, our fears are, what our, our clingings are, our hooks, our buttons, you know, everything. And so what we're trying to do, one of the things that we're trying to do here is to learn to uh, pay attention to see what complicates our attention, where we get caught, what makes it difficult. Because the place we get caught is also the place where we're going to feel stress. And as many of you know, uh, this this practice that I'm teaching you here, the mindfulness practice, has been adopted in many clinical settings in this country uh, as stress reduction, pain and stress management. And uh, the people who go to Kaiser and Sequoia and you know, El Camino Hospital, Stanford Hospital, will take these classes, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and uh, there they don't use the B word. And a, and a, lot, of people, a lot of people who go there have no clue that uh, the practice they're being taught at Kaiser comes from Buddhism. And that's good. And um, so, but, but so the place we get hung up is often the very important window into understanding how we're most likely to suffer or how we're more likely to cause problems in our life. So we start paying attention, which we all have the capacity to do, but we get interested in this practice. What, how is it that our ability to stay calmly, connected to the present moment, gets somehow disrupted. People who meditate will sometimes think that the disruption is the problem. Disruption like, sounds like a bad word, right? I got disrupted. That's something I got caught. Um, when we do this meditation practice, we don't try not to kind of judge anything as being bad or inappropriate. Rather, we try to fold everything back into the attention. To, in other words, to notice this. Pay attention. What's going on? Notice this. Notice this. Oh, I just got caught. I just heard someone cough and it reminded me that my friend was sick and I'm wondering when I should go visit my friend in the hospital. And, you know, I wonder if, how late Kaiser's open. And, and then I said, oh, I'm teaching a class. Oh. <laughs> so the... Um, so the... the um, you know, it's an example of kind of getting got pulled in. And it was a pretty innocent example, but it could, could not have been so innocent. 
Um, and so what we do is rather than saying, oh, that shouldn't have happened. I shouldn't have that train of thought. What we try to do is, is to fold everything back into the attention. Oh, look at that. That's what a disruption is like. That's what it's like for the mind to get hooked and carried away. That's what it's like. That's what it's like. Does that understand, you understand that principle? This is a really important one. People who have been meditating for sometimes, you know, 10 years haven't learned this one yet. They haven't learned that, that there's nothing, from the point of view of the mindfulness meditation, there's nothing that doesn't need to happen. There's nothing that you have to kind of say, no, that shouldn't happen. Rather, it's one more thing to learn to pay attention to. And if you learn to pay attention well, there's freedom to be found in attention. And this is one of, one of the things I hope you get a teeny taste for, at least an intuitive idea from in the course of the six weeks, that in paying attention, there's a way of paying attention where you are not caught, trapped, oppressed, influenced, driven by what's going on, inside or outside of yourself. And that gives you a tremendous power to go about your life. If you have the ability not to be pushed around by your inner compulsions or the pressures from the outside. And we learn this by learning how to use the attention in a new way. And I hope that this is one of the things we'll learn as we go along here. We begin in the mindfulness meditation with paying attention to two things. To our posture and to our breathing. And, um, and with the idea that it's really helpful to have a good, stable posture. And also a posture that somehow expresses an attentive state. Uh, it's really great to see like a little kid, like a little, tod- little toddler who's gotten, you know, really good if, they, if they're kind of owning their diapers. So you, don't, you, see, you can see their naked torso. And, um, and they've really gotten interested in something. They sit with this erect back and they're so attentive and upright. It's so beautiful to see this you know, energy of awake and present. And sometimes you see it in adults, but uh, you see it sometimes really clearly in these, you know, uncontracted children's bodies sometimes. So, you know, we, meditation, you can be a meditator and be a couch potato. It's possible. And... Um, and, uh, however, uh, your whole meditation experience is, in, is uh, improved if you let your body be a support for your attention. So it isn't just a mental thing. You're trying to become mentally attentive. But you kind of put yourself in a posture where your body is more likely to be, uh, you know, attentive. So I'll talk about that in a little bit more in a moment. Um, and then uh, we use the breathing. And the breathing has a wonderful quality of being um, continuous. Pretty much we're always breathing. And so it's always something to connect to. It's, it's, uh, there's a rhythm to breathing. It's, uh, it flows in and out. It comes and goes. And it's actually easier for the mind to pay uh, careful attention to something that's changing in a very subtle, quiet way. If you fixate your eyes and don't let your eyes move at all, you can't see very well. In order for the eyes to see well, the eyes have to actually move a little bit. They're constantly shifting and moving. So in order to develop strong concentration, it, there's something really wonderful that happens when you follow the breathing that has a nice rhythm to it. And you're, watching, you're following the change that goes on with the breath. The breathing is also closely tied to our emotional life and our psychological life and our energetic life. And so much of how we live is affected in, affects our breathing. So, for example, if you get afraid, your breathing gets sometimes constricted and tight. If um, you're rela- really relaxed and happy, your breathing tends to be more relaxed and fluid. Um, if you're nervous about something, you might breathe more f- uh, fast. Uh, and if you're relaxed, maybe you breathe more slowly. Uh, there's all these different ways the, 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 the breathing shifts, partly to give you more oxygen or less oxygen, depending on what you need. If you're attacked by a lion, you need a lot of oxygen. So the, you know, the breathing knows what's to do. You know? So if you're running a lot, for example, you, you know, kind of hyper, hyper, you know, hyperventilate a little bit. So um, the breathing is very closely tied. And so uh, as a person tends to connect to the breathing with their attention and follow the breath, one breath after the other, um, there's a reciprocal relationship with our attention and the breath. And it tends to um, uh, create a calming effect on us. It's not always the case. 
but it tends to be a calming effect. And most people who follow the breathing and get into it will find that they become much more calm and peaceful than they were before. Um, the, it's very nice and helpful to become, become calm and peaceful. But in the mindfulness meditation, uh, we don't hold that up as the great goal to become peaceful. The goal is to pay attention. So if you get more agitated as you meditate, which sometimes happens, uh, then remember the goal is just, okay, let me pay attention to this. Let me fold this back into the meditation. Let me do mindfulness of uh, agitation. And um, it might be really helpful sometimes. So, for example, it might be something you haven't looked at very carefully in your life ever, that you've been holding at a distance. And as you sit, starting to relax in meditation, you lower your guard. So if some of you don't want to lower your guard, don't do meditation. You lower your guard. And when you lower your guard, then this thing bubbles up. And then, oh no, now I have to look at it. And then you get agitated. But I'm meditating, so be calm. And then you're more agitated because you're judging yourself. Just, just fold it in. Oh, okay, now I get to pay attention to what it's like to be agitated. So the breath is calming. It's also because it's, it's continuous, going back and forth. It's a wonderful place to train yourself to be in the present moment. And the trick uh, for this mindfulness meditation is how to keep ourselves in the present. And you probably all find out very soon when we meditate how difficult it is to stay in the present moment. The mind has a mind of its own and it will take you away. But we're trying to train the mind to stay in the present so we can offer careful attention to what is going on in the present. And from a Buddhist point of view, all the wisdom, all the insight, all the enlightenment that you need to have in your life will be found, only be found, when you're able to stay in the present. If you're not in the present, you're not going to find it. It's not going to be there. So the breath is a place where we train ourselves to, to uh, uh, calm down enough, to settle the mind, to concentrate the mind enough so the mind can begin to uh, stay present in the present moment. So breath meditation has a lot of functions. It's very beneficial. So we, I consider it kind of the foundation. And then from that foundation, then we expand the attention beyond that, eventually to include all of our life. So we'll start very narrow, just the breathing this week. Then next week, the body and emotions. It's kind of like we're expanding out and out and out. And by the end of the course, I hope you have some sense of how to bring this wonderful capacity of attention, this clear, non-reactive, non-judgmental attention to all aspects of your life. That's the goal. Make sense? So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about meditation posture. So, for sitting meditation, there are basically two primary postures that people tend to use. One is sitting on the floor, the so-called cross-legged position, and the other is in a chair. And you're welcome to sit in either one. There are some little advantages, some small advantages sitting on the floor, uh, but um, you know, it's fine to sit in a chair. And in the iconography of uh, Buddhism, uh, they had this Buddhism has idea that far in the future there's going to be the next Buddha. And so they have sometimes statues of the next Buddha. And he's always sitting in a chair. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really fine to sit in a chair. Um, the, um, so what I'll do is I'll talk about both, chair and sitting on the floor. The most important thing about posture is to have a, an alert spine. So sit in such a way that your spine is kind of alert, kind of upright. You don't want to be so upright it's you're tense, but you want to sit upright uh, so it's some sense of alertness. Um, and also in some, such a way that um, you're not going to cause long-term problems. If you're uh, stooped over a lot, meditating this way, most people, especially people who have a sedentary life, will probably find that their back will go out at some point. And, uh, and it's really good to train yourself to sit with a good upright uh, back posture both for the chair and for the floor. Um, now, one of, the ways we, one of the ways we do that on the floor is, classically, we sit on a round cushion. It's called in Japanese a zafu. And, um, and the idea is to sit on the front third of it. So you're kind of sitting on the, kind of the forward edge. So that, and let it, so it lets your, your, your uh, pelvis tip forward. 
And when you have to propel this forward, it helps the knees come down, and it also creates a little curve in the lower part of your back. You don't want to overarch. You want basically the natural, maybe slightly more than the uh, curve than natural curve. Um, a little bit of sense of still strength there in your lower back. And, um, and what you want to do is you want to try, ideally, to have both knees on the floor and your butt on the cushion. And it's easier to get your knees down if you're elevated. That's you sit, sit on the cushion. If your hips are really tight, then sitting really high helps. You can get two cushions or build up a whole throne and, um, and in order to get your knees down. If uh, you can't get your knees down for any reason, then um, you can also, uh, you know, like, like uh, you can prop it up like this, you know, and some, or prop both of them up, get a sweater or something and go like that. That's okay to do. And, um, and if you have that nice tripod of the uh, three points, your knees and your butt, uh, it creates a nice stable base for uh, holding your, the rest of your torso upright. It's nice to have that low center of gravity and that wide base for sitting. You don't tend to have that in the chair, so that's one of the advantages of sitting this way. Um, I recommend that uh, for sitting on the floor, that you don't sit cross-legged, uh, but uh, you know, technically you don't cross your legs, but rather, uh, it's called uh, Taylor fashion or Burmese fashion, you have one leg in front of the other, like how my arms are here, like this. So they're not actually crossed. And then, um, like this, my, my, my arms. And, um, and it also, that's a lot more comfortable for people to sit full lotus or half lotus. People can do that. There's some advantages to sitting in the lotuses, but um, you know, most people, it's not realistic, you know, because of knees and hips and stuff. And, and um, so this tends to be much more comfortable. Uh, most people who are not used to this, it takes a while to, to kind of for the body to stretch out. And so you get, so you get comfortable with it. But you know, it's, it's well worth doing. Kind of like this, one, one in front of the other. Um, now, if you're sitting on a chair, the recommendation in the chair is definitely you don't cross your legs, but you have both, um, both feet um, flat on the ground parallel to each other. So both the soles of the feet are firmly planted on the ground or in a cushion if you need support. And the trick there is you don't want to have your knees higher than your hips because then it tends to push out the lower part of your back and then it tends to get a strain there soon enough. So uh, ideally your knees maybe be a little bit lower than your hips or maybe just it's a parallel to your hips. Uh, some people do like to have their legs out sideways um, because it tends to give them a wider base and more support. So you're welcome to do that, that as well. Uh, if you're sitting on the, on the, on the mat, on the, on the floor, there are some alternative ways of sitting which are nice. Um, another way of sitting is uh, you can get a bench. Um, there are these wooden benches. I think we have a few in the corner, or maybe or Victor has one here. You see the bench like this? You hold up really high so people... And uh, you, you kind of slip it under, under, your, under your thighs, back of your butt, and then you slip your legs underneath. You, you're on top and your legs go underneath. And um, so you're more like sitting on your knees. And that's a nice way of sitting. Another way of sitting is you take one of these round cushions and you have it upright like this and you put it between your ankles and you sit down like this. Now, you don't have the wide tripod kind of thing, but it's a way of getting kind of low center of gravity and some people really, really like it this way. And some people can't sit cross-legged, so sitting this way, they like, like it this way. Um, now, if you're uh, sitting in the chair, um, let's continue here on the floor a little bit. So. Um, as I said earlier, the having the back straight is really important. And uh, one way to help you do that, you can do this both on the floor and the chair, is you take your um, hands on either sides of your hips and on the, on the ground or on the side of the chair and push yourself up off the chair or cushion as hard as you can. And then um, as you let go of your arms, uh, let your shoulders kind of roll a little bit back. And probably you'll find yourself sitting straighter now. Your, your chest will be more open, your shoulders perhaps hanging a little bit more. And uh, that's a good, uh, probably more alert, erect posture than you had before. If you're sitting in a chair, the recommendation is, uh, if you can, don't use the backrest. Um, now, if people have all kinds of conditions in their back that require them to use a backrest, so it's fine to do that. 
But uh, there's a variety of reasons for that. One is that you're more likely to kind of when you use a backrest to kind of lean into it and relax too much and fall asleep. <laughs> and um, another reason is a little more subtle, and that is, um, at least in Buddhism, we're trying to develop a certain kind of ability to be self-reliant. And there's a connection between our physical body and our emotional life. And uh, it's easier to discover how to be self-reliant emotionally or psychologically if you're self-reliant uh, physically. And so if you're relying on something when you meditate, uh, just you know, it's a small, subtle thing, but you know, you, you, it's a little bit uh, more harder to, to you, you know, get that support to discover that inner self-reliance we're looking for. If you need to use a backrest, um, uh, what we prefer or to suggest to you is that you use the support as low down as your back will allow. So have some, like a, you can have a, a, a pillow really low down so your lower back is supported but your upper back is uh, free. Or, or as low as you can with your back. Now some people have to use the whole backrest and that's fine. And in fact some people here at our center and actually one of, our, one of, the, uh, uh, one of the people who teaches here at our center um, uh, do their meditation mostly lying down because of uh, various kinds of injuries they have had. And so it's fine to do, uh, you know, laying down on your back as well. There's just some more challenges with falling asleep and stuff that goes on there. And if you want later, I can talk about that to some people. But, um, so we're gonna sit up straight. And then um, the hands, we put the hands in any way where both hands are doing the same thing and they're comfortable. The classic Buddhist meditation posture for hands the hands are together in front of the kind of just below the belly button and um, and uh, kind of self is kind of floating, not resting on anything, but floating up here um, with the thumbs, tips touching lightly. Uh, that's a classic, classic way of doing it. Um, uh, many people will, will do it like this with their hands on their knees or thighs. I usually meditate this way like this now and uh, hands up or pointing up or pointing down doesn't matter. Um, what does matter, though, is that sometimes um, if you have your hands resting on your ankles all the way down, or if you have your hands too far forward on your thighs and your knees, it sometimes pulls the shoulders forward. And you create, actually, over time, you create a strain back here. So uh, what might, um, it also kind of pulls you down. People tend to sl- slouch more easily. So it's possible, it's okay to get something like a cushion or a sweater or a towel and put it on top of your heel or ankles. So your hands are held up higher. So held up, so you don't have that strain back there. Or simply you can pull your hands in from your, from your knee. And then the ancient texts, meditation manuals, all talk about how important it is to have your head squarely on top of your shoulders. Now, where else would it be? <laughs> However, uh, it's very easy for people for their heads to fall forward the chins to stick out like this, head go forward, or sometimes the head turns to the side, tips to the side. But the idea is to keep it straight. And the, the, um, the ancients talked about lining up your ears with your shoulders. That's how it should be. So not forward. And also, they, they, there's, a, there's an idea in Buddhism that if your chin goes up like this, it's usually a sign that you're lost in thought. And if you pull your chin back in, down a little bit, uh, that actually controls the wandering mind a little bit. You probably try it and you won't believe it. Um, so there is also this idea that uh, it's good to tuck your chin back and down a little bit when you meditate. Uh, you can do the same effect by opening up space between your last vertebrae uh, and your skull. And I actually like that, that you open, open space rather than kind of pull down. Um, but kind of puts the head in the same position. And um, in our tradition here, uh, we, uh, we instruct people to meditate with the eyes closed. It's not necessary to have the eyes closed. Uh, there are teachers in our tradition who do sometimes teach keep meditate with the eyes open. And often if people are really sleepy, we tell them, meditate with your eyes open. Um, but it's nice, we recommend eyes closed. And, uh, but if you've done other meditation practices before that involved eyes open and you're more comfortable that way, please, you can do that. Um, and then... Um, the uh, mouth is kept closed and uh, it said that it's helpful to have the tongue resting lightly against the palate, the top of the mouth. So that's the basic uh, uh, elements of posture. 
you have any questions about the posture part? Yes, please. Huh? Do you know about that? I've well, never heard that. Well, the in Dalai they teach that. Oh, that could well be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you're welcome. You're welcome to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But it is a definite difference. Yeah. It has to do with the meaning and the energy Yeah, I don't know. I know that uh, in, in uh, Southeast Asia, or classically in, uh, in India, the um, left hand was on the bottom, and then in Zen, they switched it so the left hand is on top. And I think it's something like one hand is supposed to be more compassion, the other wisdom. And, uh, and so, you know, there's some, some theory like that. So I, I learned in the Zen tradition so, to have the left hand on top. But there was never any differentiation in Zen between men and women. But, you know, if you find a difference, you're welcome. Yeah. Sir? Yes, please. Do you ever meditate the lights off and keep them on? Uh, both ways are fine. Uh, you, uh, usually, uh, if you're really sleepy, sometimes sitting in front of a light can be helpful. Even with your eyes closed, or having a lot of light coming in uh, can kind of stimulate you and keep you a little bit awake. Uh, and if it's really dark, maybe it's a little bit easier to fall asleep. Um, but you can kind of experiment and see what works best for you. There's no hard and fast rule. Okay, so um, you got the basic posture. So why don't we're going to uh, uh, do a, a guided meditation. So uh, those of you who would like to try sitting on the floor, there's space here. There's more cushions up there. You can go get some. And um, otherwise you can stay in your chair. So get yourself into a, what feels like a stable and alert posture. Hopefully one that feels also somewhat relaxed. So this balance between being relaxed and alert is an important issue. And then uh, gently close your eyes. And then please remember that the most basic thing we're doing is simply noticing, knowing what is happening in the present moment. It's a really simple. Before you learn any ideas about getting concentrated or peaceful or making something happen, we're just, just noticing. So you might take a moment now, just notice how you are, what's going on for you. What's your own immediate experience, lived experience here and now. And as you pay attention to here and now, how easy is it to stay here and now? And are you operating any, any, any ideas that something is supposed to happen, that you're trying to accomplish something, more than just notice? In order to help us settle in and get connected to the present moment, it's often helpful at the beginning of the meditation session to take a few long, slow, deep breaths. Breathing in deeply. And then as you exhale, relaxing your body. Letting go of whatever tension you can easily let go of. breathing to return to normal. And for this mindfulness meditation, 
we're making no effort at all to breathe in any special way. If you've learned yogic breathing or any other kind of special breathing techniques, we don't breathe as a technique. We just let ourselves breathe whatever way we are. And then also at the beginning, it can be helpful to kind of briefly scan through your body to see if there's any simple places where you can relax some of the muscles in your body. So it might be possible to soften your forehead, your eyes, Might be possible to soften your jaws. Some people find it helpful to uh, drop their mouth open for a moment and then float the teeth back together again. Float the lips back together. And that can kind of loosen up the jaw a little bit. A number of people carry tension in their shoulders. Even if it's not possible to relax the shoulders, maybe there can be a softening around whatever tension is in your shoulders. Perhaps you're able to soften a little bit in the chest. And also it can be helpful to relax your belly. Keep your stomach soft. Your belly maybe hangs forward a little bit. So first, breathing in deeply. And second, you're breathing normally and then just scanning the body and softening whatever you can. That's easy to soften. And then next, see if you can get a global awareness of your body. Don't try too hard, but just whatever broad awareness of your body that you can establish, letting your attention wander around your body, kind of from the inside, feeling it, sensing it. Feeling the contact of your body against your chair or the cushion. Then within your body, as part of your bodily experience, become aware of how your body experiences breathing. How does your body know that you're breathing or feel that you're breathing? What happens in your body as you breathe? What moves, what changes, what shifts? Some people can feel the movement of their belly going up and down, rising and falling, or their chest rising and falling. The rib cage expanding and contracting. Some people can feel the air coming in and out through the nostrils. If you have trouble finding your breath or connecting to the experience of breathing, you can put your hand perhaps over your diaphragm or in your belly and maybe you'll feel the movement there. So wherever you feel your breathing most predominantly in your body, let that be your home base. So you're going to try to cultivate your ability to stay in the present moment for the experience of breathing in that place. Feeling the shifts and changes and the in-breaths and the out breath.
And there might be a variety of things that make it difficult for you to stay continuous with the breathing. Be relaxed about that. And the idea is to be, just know what is happening. No, oh, I'm easily distracted. I'm easily concerned about other, other things. Just know that. The mind so natural so easily wanders off in thought. As soon as you notice that's happening, then gently, smilingly, bring your attention back to your breathing. Take your awareness or attention, enter into the experience of breathing as if it's something you can deeply trust. It's a good place to be. Try to notice, be alert enough to notice when you wander off in thought. And then soften, relax, back to the breath. But when you connect to the breathing again, to stay with it, do it with a kind of some sense of determination to hang in there with the breathing. So you can hang in there with the rhythm of many in-breaths and out-breaths in a row. You might have various concerns that are vying for attention or issues. See if you can let them be in the background. And in the foreground, you're just kind of tuning into the breath, being with the breath, being with the rhythm of breathing in and out, being with the physical experience of breathing. Perhaps as you do that, just being with it it's a little more cal- Ill calming or settling.
Some people find it helpful to very, very, very softly in the mind label the in-breath in, the out-breath out, or as the chest or belly rises, say rising, as it falls, say falling. Just a very quiet whisper in the mind that just encourages you to hang in there, to stay present instead of getting distracted. We will sit for two more minutes. In these last couple of minutes, see if you can stay connected to the breath, to the breathing. And then just as it's useful to set, take a few minutes to settle into meditation, it's useful to take a little bit of time to kind of come out of it. And the simple way to do this is to take a few deep breaths again. Feel your body as you breathe in deeply. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes. I'd like to emphasize that mindfulness of breathing, breath meditation, uh, works when it doesn't work. So it works in a sense if you can stay with your breath. You might think that you you would say, well, it didn't work because I couldn't stay with my breathing. When it doesn't work, when we're, the primary thing we're doing, remember, is not staying with the breath; it's paying attention. So when it doesn't work, when you can't stay with the breath, then you're supposed to notice what it is that's making it difficult. What's going on? You're concerned about something, you're thinking about something, you're feeling something, something's going on, and you notice what that is. And if you notice what the, what's, what's making, it, making it difficult for you to be present, you're doing the practice. So either you're present, there's three options. Either you're present, or you're not present, in which case you don't have any problem. <laughs> you're not present, you know. No problems. 
Um, and then the third option is that um, you're present enough to know what's challenging you to be present. In this practice, we don't t- treat that as a problem. We just say, oh, this is just, let me notice this. Let me notice this. So if you go to a mountain stream, a very shallow, pure, clear mountain stream, it's possible with some of these streams that you look at the water and you don't see it moving. You look at the water standing still. But then you take a stick and put it in vertically into the water and a little wake gets formed by the current. You say, oh, in fact, it's moving. But you need to have that reference point to see the current, make a current so you see it moving. So same thing with the mind. The mind needs to have a reference point so it can see itself clearly. And the breathing is that reference point. So, and uh, as some of you will learn, very soon need to learn, that your mind is out of control. <laughs> you know, you, you, got a, you know, you were lucky if you got two breaths in a row. And the mind's just all over, you know, or what breath? <laughs> and um, some people are so caught up in their thoughts so easily that they didn't even hear that I gave instructions during the sitting. There's all kinds of things, you know. So, so um, um, or there might be strong emotions that come along, or strong sensations in the body. All kinds of things might come along. And, um, but especially with the mind, the movements of the mind, movements of feelings. Um, some of the things you feel and think might be pretty obvious to yourself. But as you do this meditation practice, what you'll start doing is uncovering uh, a lot of tough stuff about yourself that you didn't really know. So one of the things, for example, that people will learn if they start to try to stay with the breath, to have that reference point, is they'll learn how busy the mind is. And people say, I didn't know my mind was so active. I didn't know my mind was wandering off so much. I didn't know my mind was caught up in so many concerns. I didn't know it until I tried to have that reference point of the breath. So learning that, being attentive to that, uh, is good. It's part of the practice. So that's why I say breath meditation works when it doesn't work. Isn't it great to do something you can't fail? <laughs> so, um, so what kind of experience does some of you have to that 15 minutes of sitting together? Anything you want to share anything or comment or question? So you said that this is the first time since the car accident a couple of years ago that you could sit down and not somehow get caught by the little tensions in your back. And, uh, and if you get caught, I guess in the past, you also would contract more and it would spiral out. And here, you could just, the first time you could sit down, just be with your breath, trust the breath, and somehow that your, breath, your back was fine, wasn't a concern. Congrats, I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's it's common, you know, if you're going to, uh, anybody who meditates sooner or later will start uh, experiencing the falling asleep in meditation. And, uh, and uh, people who are new to meditation, it sometimes happens because the habit, uh, most people's habit is when you close your eyes for any length of time, it means you're going to go to sleep so that the habits can kick in. So it'd take a while to kind of overcome those. The other thing is that um, it said that uh, a lot of Americans are sleep deprived. And uh, I think there's a lot of people, a lot of probably you, who probably need to sleep more than you need to meditate. Um, so, um, so, the, uh, so you could, um, uh, no, you could open your eyes. Uh, that's one thing. You can also kind of arouse more physical and or mental energy to kind of keep yourself more alert. Uh, some people who are really sleepy in meditation find that they can actually, uh, uh, if they stand, do standing meditation. Do the same meditation practice as standing. Uh, that just tends to keep them awake and alert and keep them going. And at any point, you know, anybody here at IMC is welcome to stand, do standing meditation. You don't have to do it sitting. You know, if you feel like you need, need that energy, uh, stay alert. Um, the um, sleepiness is, you know, a part of the territory people have to work with. Um, and opening your eyes can help. Yes? 
Okay, I was just saying that um, I was relieved when you said there was two more minutes to go, even though I was really enjoying the experience and trying to stay focused. And I was curious to know, obviously this is something we need to practice, and do you have suggestions about how we might um, build up over time? Uh, great. So, um, so th- this, this uh, six-week course works best if you go home now and meditate every day. After a six-week course, you can do whatever you want. But... Uh, <laughs> You can do whatever you want now also, but, but the, um, it just works better because it actually builds. And if you go home and try to put this to practice, you get some experience on it with it. And what, what you'll learn over the course of the week uh, will actually be a foundation for next week. It turns out it's easier to pay attention to your uh, body if you have an ability to pay attention to your breath. It's easier to pay attention to your emotion if you have an easy ability to pay attention to your body. And it's easier to pay attention to your thoughts if you have an ability to stay, um, be attentive to your emotions. And it's easier to pay ten- attention to your mind if you have an ability to pay attention to your thoughts. So it builds, right? So anyway, so there's some more familiarity you can get over the week. So I'd encourage you to, uh, the first week, uh, every day to meditate 20 minutes. And if you're new to meditation, um, do 20 minutes. And uh, if you're not new to meditation, you could uh, do more if you want. We do 20 minutes, and then, um, for the, and then uh, next week, I'm going to suggest 25 minutes, and the following week, 30 minutes. And then I think we level off at 30 minutes. And then afterwards, you can decide to go back if you want. So that's my recommendation, if that's possible for you. Um, the, um, uh, many, many people find it most useful to meditate early in the morning, uh, before the, kind of the day begins, and kind of society wakes up a lot, and your phone is likely to ring or stuff. Um, it's, you know, it's an ancient tradition to get up early in the morning and meditate. Some people find, for whatever reason, for many reasons, that uh, the late afternoon or the early evening or late evening works better for them. Find what works best for you. Um, but also uh, consider what, uh, that when you sit down to meditate, that you're really going to keep that as a meditation time. Because there's all kinds of really important things that will pop up that seem like, you know, I, I should do that instead. Like, it might occur to you that it's really necessary at this moment to defrost the freezer. <laughs> and so, um, so the idea is, you know, when you sit down to do your 20 minutes, you don't want to be disturbed by, you know, just, okay, you're going to do it. And um, it's also useful to designate some part, of, if you can, if you have a big enough home, some corner of your bedroom or some place that's your designated meditation place, and not much else happens there if possible. Um, so that um, it's kind of like your association you have with that place is coming to meditate. The power of association can be very helpful. And for the same reason, it's also said that it's not useful to meditate in your bed, because it has others, other associations. And um, uh, it's also helpful to wear loose-fitting clothes. Uh, in fact, uh, if you have a tight belt, it's useful to uh, undo your belt before you meditate. Uh, some people want to know how do you keep time for like the time. Uh, it's not so useful to have a clock and keep opening your eyes to look and check. That's not useful. <laughs> so it's you know having some kind of timing system is good. And there's all kinds of timing systems, electronic systems now, so it shouldn't be too hard to find. It can even be a kitchen timer as long as it doesn't tick a lot. Um, but um, even some phones I think have uh, you know timers in them. Uh, s- um, some people have. Um, Recorded and then a recording, like a digital recording, of uh, 20 minutes of silence, and then rung a bell at the end. And so you you, know, you plug in your tape or your CD or whatever, and meditation CD, and, and you play the silence, and then ding ding for 20 minutes. That's so people like that. I think on our IMC's website somewhere there is there is you can download onto your computer a meditation timer. Or you can play it off the computer or something, and so it'll ring. I've never tried it, but. It's, it's, what? Yeah, you need an MP3 player or a computer that plays MP3 and you can, you know, get it that way. Other questions or comments? Yes? Um, how long did we meditate this evening? About 15 minutes. 15 minutes. 15 to do, we, do you recommend that everybody listening to music like meditating? Ah, do I recommend music or something? No. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, it's uh, certainly wonderful to meditate to music. And it's wonderful to, you know, you know all that. But the idea is uh, here, there's something very different we're trying to do here with this practice here. And that is to discover how to enter into a present moment state of attentive and clarity and calm without being helped. And uh, you can be helped, but then you have a crutch. And we're trying to do, find out how to do it ourselves. And, and the, 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 um, what that requires of you is to really learn yourself really well. If you're using something else as a prop to help you, you actually bypass that self-learning that has to happen that allows you some kind of spiritual depth. So we actually, so some people like guided meditation. It's fine to use them some. But in the long term, you're aiming at a situation where you're just relying on yourself. Now, after you've done your 20, 20 minutes of meditation with us this way, then you're welcome to do 20 minutes with music. <laughs> you know, you know, you know. Yes. So I found myself kind of using a mental prop. I believe that you or someone I heard in the past uh, suggested, which was to stay on the breath by counting the breath. I was counting up and down and 20 and back, and that just really helped me stay on the breath. But is that cheating? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's allowed. It's allowed. It's, uh, we consider it more of a concentration practice. And I sometimes teach it to people. I did it for years, breath counting. is what I was taught in Zen. And uh, it's a great practice. Um, it, um, we think of it more of a concentration practice than an attention practice. However, I, I teach it to some people when their minds are just really out of control. It's, you know, this is like just, they just go off all the time. And, and then accounting can really help kind of ground a person, anchor the person. So you're welcome to do it. The usual way of doing it is to count one to ten. You can do it your way, but one to ten. Each breath gets a count of one, so one, two, three. And, um, and then um, when you get to ten, you start over again at one. If you lose count in the process of going up to ten, don't think about it, don't try to figure out where you're at, just go back to one. And if you get to twelve or thirteen, that's a sign that your mindfulness has slipped. <laughs> and um, so, but what, what, instead of counting, what our tradition uses is what, what we call mental noting or labeling. Remember I said use in, out, or rising, falling? Uh, um, um, an idle mind will get in trouble. So a mind kind of wants to think. So it's kind of a bit hard to kind of stop the mind from thinking and getting caught by your thoughts. So what we do, what we, what we do is, we, what you can do, is a little technique, is to use a very, very subtle, primitive kind of thought, a name or a label. So the thinking mind is engaged. So it feels like it has a place in life. And, and, and so it's helpful. So, so, it's, it's, so it's encouraging you to stay there, stay there, stay there, pay attention there. So with the breathing, it could be in, as you breathe in, out, as you breathe out. And it's very, very soft, super soft. It's almost like you're doing nothing at all. Um, but it's mostly just like this little, little puff that's encouraging you to stay there with the in. Experience that in-breath. Experience that out-breath. Some people prefer, the way I was taught in Asia, was, was to label it rising, falling. So as this belly or the, stump or the chest rises, say rising, as it falls, falling. And um, again, so it's a way of, so that way the, the thinking mind is not idle, it's engaged in the process and helping you. And some people find that helpful. Yes? I found something very interesting today. I was just wondering if you could address it a little. Um, and it was maybe at some point we'll be talking a little bit about physical ailments and all. Um, it's a little while ago when I was meditating and I was starting to, I noticed that I, I had this stomach problem that seems to gurgle a lot. Right. And as I practiced through my I Chi and was practicing my breathing techniques and things that I do, um, I was able to, it subsided. And then I've had a really nice two months worth of nice rhythmic breathing, able to meditate, feeling comfortable. And tonight, I really appreciate getting into the position and feeling it all over the And then I started in. And I was, it, it started up again. And so I'm thinking, well, I tried all my little, feel the stomach, feel the in, and finally I, I, I focused, as you had stated, on the situation and just kind of like let my breathing take over. And it was a total breathing I had not, I had not even experienced. It was a very, almost quicker, shallower breathing. And it wasn't one that I normally would have been comfortable with, but it worked. Great. And so does the body fall into its own rhythm? I mean, I, I would think that the body would fall into it and help correct physical ailments, 
But is, is that make sense to you at all? Or? I understand you. A uh, few things. One is that uh, there's a lot of physical ailments that are uh, either come from or are strengthened by stress. And in fact, you know, stress kind of finds the weak link in the system. And so wherever your weak link is, your stomach or your heart or something, stress can somehow, not like stress is causing the problem, but it's the weak link, right? So um, uh, something like meditation, which can relax and let go of a lot of stress, um, can, um, can you know, stop that stress, can stop that kind of, uh, uh, it doesn't, I mean, some ailments can get a lot better with meditation. Uh, some heart conditions, a lot of things. There's no guarantee. I'm not a doctor. Um, and um, but more than that, as a person really gets settled into the present moment and starts developing some concentration in the present moment, not only are we not producing stress, we're actually doing the opposite. We're starting to produce all kinds of chemicals and, and, uh, and energies and emotions that are actually healing in and of themselves. They're very helpful. Good energies. There's joy, there's rapture, there's uh, deep states of peace, there's good energy that kind of begins coursing through the body, which can be healing and helpful. But there's no, no, no way of knowing whether meditation is going to help any particular individual if with their particular issues. And, and in terms of the breathing, uh, when we do ma- mindfulness meditation, um, mostly we just trust the way we are breathing. And if it's shallow and fast, we just tune into that. Like, okay, this is what it, now I'm learning to pay attention to a fast and shallow breath. This is what it's like. As opposed to trying to shift it and change it. And then if you just use your attention, attention is kind of like a... Um, I think of attention, awareness, as kind of like giving something room to unfold. So I'll tell, I'll tell a story, uh, and then um, we'll go home. If um, you go into an elevator, a small elevator is made for two people, and it's you and four really big, ugly, disgusting... <laughs> people with ketchup down their shirts and stinking and all that. And you have to squeeze in there between them all. And, you know, and they're like, you know, you're as high as their belly button, right? Just, you know, you probably feel claustrophobic and you're happy to get out of the elevator. Now, if you go into a huge cathedral and it's the four of you, the five of you, the four, four big people and you, and they're spread out evenly throughout this huge, you know, cathedral, then it's easy to love all humanity. <laughs> <laughs> And um, because you don't, you're not you know, being oppressed by them so closely. So uh, the same way with the mind. If the mind is writing things really close or there's too much input coming on at once, the mind's so busy and active and concerned, and so attached, so clinging, it's claustrophobic and it can feel very uncomfortable. As we develop awareness, the attention, it's kind of like making more room in the mind. Uh, awareness or attention can have the sense of being like space it's actually the more centered you are and more grounded you are in attention or awareness, the bigger this mental space is in your mind. And, uh, and so you have more space for all that stuff in your mind. And then you have a much different relationship to all this stuff than if you um, are, um, you, know, you know, claustrophobic in the mind, if it's crowded in there with all this stuff. And um, so as we make room in the mind, then some of the mental and physical uh, structures in the mind that need to unravel, need to unfold, need to evolve in some way, have the space in the room to evolve or to change or unravel. Some of the things that happen uh, will unwind. Uh, sometimes med- giving space or awareness to what's going on, just noticing and giving space, allowing it to be there, it's kind of like pulling the, the, um, the cork from out of a, fu- a bathtub full of water. The water will drain out. So certain tensions, certain things will just drain out. Other things will grow and develop in that space. And so there's beautiful qualities, uh, wisdom, um, clarity, integrity, patience, concentration. A lot of things will develop and grow in that space. So um, the awareness, is uh, bringing awareness, attention to what's going on, learning to be relaxed in that attention. So you're relaxed in what's there, even if it's uncomfortable, even what's there, there is uncomfortable, being relaxed, paying, being relaxed in how you pay attention to the discomfort in a sense, creates that space. And then uh, what I, th- I think a lot of meditators learn, you learn to trust the innate uh, wisdom or the innate intelligence that can unfold towards health. It's almost as if there's an innate movement towards health. Um, even if you're dying, uh, 
the uh, uh, people who die who meditate uh, will find that a spiritual life or a meditative life can actually move people as they're dying to a certain kind of um, um, wholeness. So you might not cure the illness, but you become whole. So if you're going to die, it's nice to die whole rather than fragmented or something else. So there's an, there seems to be an innate intelligence that kind of moves towards wholeness. And, and so you just need to get, a lot of it has to do with getting out of the way, getting out of the way. And meditation is one of those ways it helps. But you can't get out of the way and not be present. You have to get out of the way and be present. You have to be present and then get out of the way. So, so there's a thing of attention. Pay attention and be relaxed about what you pay attention to. Include everything in your attention and then be relaxed about what's there. Does that make sense? Probably not that much. <laughs> it's supposed to, you have to learn how it makes sense over the next weeks or months or years. <laughs> so it takes a while to get the hang of this. So thank you for coming. It's, uh, it was nice to have you. And uh, so next week we'll talk about how to include the body which includes some degree talking about physical discomfort as well. Thank you.